I'll go ahead and start. I just want to welcome everyone. Good morning. It's so lovely to see all these wonderful faces, familiar faces and new faces. And just wanting to be taking this time to really welcome everyone. I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Heidi Mahano, and I'm the executive director for the Peaceful World Foundation. Uh, and I want to take this moment really to invite us after having a bit of a struggle to get us here online. I want to welcome Karen. It's a delight to have you here. And uh, if we can take our moment to just um, center our posture a bit in front of our screen, since we'll be together for about an hour. And perhaps maybe we can relax our shoulders a bit and bring our attention to our chest and our breathing. Taking a moment to acknowledge our presence as we're gathered here in front of our screens to listen and to share. I'd like again to thank you everyone for being here. Our organization, the Peaceful World Foundation was founded by the late Sami Sunchild and it was established in 2006. Now Sami's mission was to foster a culture of global peace through the promotion of hosted conversations the arts and mindful education. She had a way of bringing people together around a breakfast table and asked the question, what are we doing to contribute to peace in the world? Today, the Peaceful World Foundation strives to carry on her vision, her legacy of mindful conversations while supporting, assisting and encouraging communities and community members in their own peace building efforts. Recently, our own efforts have included a two part series on exploring creativity and aging within community. And today we're exploring part two of this series on the theme healing through the arts. But before we begin this conversation, I'd really like to take this opportunity for us to share with one another our name and where we're dialing in from. So again, my name is Heidi. I'm really happy to be here today. And I'm calling in from Richmond, Virginia. Thank you, Heidi. I'll go next. My name is Julian. I'm the co-facilitator of this space. And I'm dialing in from El Paso, Texas today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Genesis and I'm dialing in from Miami, Florida today. I'll be on the back end. Thank you, Genesis. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tamara. I'm dialing in from work uh, here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So it's a little crazy here, but nice to see everyone. Hello, I'm Dave Whitridge, and I'm dialing in from uh, Corte Madera, California. Hi, Dave. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am Doug Lurch, and I'm calling in from Petaluma, California. Thanks for joining us. Karen, do you want to say where you're dialing in from today? Hi, my name is Karen Collins. I'm dialing in from Indianapolis, Indiana via Compton, California. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm Josepha Vaughn. I'm executive director of Artseed and I'm dialing in from San Francisco, the Presidio. Nice to be here and see your faces. Thank you. Hi everyone, Anu Menon um, from Oasis for Girls, also in San Francisco. Nice to see you, Anu. <laughs> Hi, I'm Francis. I'm dialing, also dialing in from San Francisco, from the Outer Mission. Good to see you, Francis. I don't know if I'm sorry for coming in late. My name is Julie Hazelwood, and, and I'm in Santa Cruz, and I'm glad to see you all. Thanks. Hi. So I just want to introduce our program facilitator, Julian Antonio Carrillo, and uh, he'll be leading us to our conversation today. So thank, thank you so you. much, Heidi, and mm -hmm. welcome everyone. Thank you for, for being here. I'm just going to jump right into it. Today's topic is really fascinating. Essentially, we're going to be talking about the power of art and creativity as a multidimensional process. So there's the physicality of it, right? what's produced, but behind it, there's also the intangible aspects, those things 
that we can't see, we can't touch, and we can't really know about unless we ask the artist, you know, what were their intentions behind the work? And what is that, that they're contributing to community? In particular, today we're very honored to be centering the work of miniature, miniaturist Karen Collins, whose work, among many things, is a labor of love and is also very intentionally uplifting individual lives, their stories, as well as healing personal and collective wounds. Karen is a self-taught, self-identifying folk artist based in Compton, California, as you heard her say. She has over 24 years of experience creating material representations of important events and people in the Black community. Working with her own resources and with the help of some volunteers at times, Karen has taken her work to many public schools to engage directly with kids and youth. And she's intent on impacting their knowledge of self, their sense of belonging, as well as help them envision and create a better future. Karen has also exhibited at important museums. Some of them have even invited her to produce new works. So they've commissioned her and she can probably share some of that today. So without further ado, I'd like to pass on the mic to Karen. She'll say a few words and introduce us to a video clip that will further contextualize her work. Welcome again, Karen. The mic hello, is every, hello, everyone. I'm Karen Collins. I'm very honored to be here to talk about my work. Uh, I created the African American Miniature Museum uh, some years ago. Sometimes I forget what year. I see it. 99, I think, something like that. Anyway, uh, it's an interactive piece, really, because I take it to the elementary and secondary schools. And the children that come in to see it are mesmerized, really. And they look and they study the dioramas and it's information inside each box to tell them exactly what they're looking at. And it was motivated by something that was the hardest thing I ever faced in my life. And that was the incarceration of my son. And um, you're gonna see a film today, a short uh, documentary about the story that I told to uh, the filmmaker that shot um, the story, Atlas Obscura. So it's a, a colorful one, it's a joyful one. For me, it didn't start out that way, but it saved my life, so. So I'm yeah. gonna go ahead and share my screen and show a clip of the video that Karen's talking about. I'm gonna go ahead and start this. First of all, I never had a doll house as a child. We were really, too poor. My mother, she raised us, five of us, by herself. But I knew how to make a dollhouse out of cardboard boxes. So I would make those for myself and my sisters to play with. I finally bought one when I was about 40. And I just loved the size and the scale of miniatures. I could decorate down the carpet and the wallpaper and everything, and that was exciting. Uh, by then I'd had two children, my son and my daughter. I thought no person ever loved anybody as much as I loved my son. I really thought that. The last time I saw him then, when he was free, he was going with his father to be a size for his tuxedo for the prom. And when I got home, I got a call from him saying he was in jail. And um, I just, you know, 
fell apart. Just fell apart. And because he had a prior record, then, uh-huh. This is the checkers game where grandson and granddad will bond. When this bill is law, three strikes and you're out will be the law of the land. It will be used to put a hundred thousand police officers on the street. It will be used to build prisons to keep a hundred thousand violent criminals off the street. It will be used to give our young people something to say yes to. <laughs> He didn't deserve 167 years. He didn't kill anybody or anything like that. So why would you give him 167 years? When they killed Trayvon and Mike Brown, oh my God, when uh, Mike Brown's mother said, do you know how hard it is to bring a black child and let him graduate from high school? And that really hit me because I knew what she was talking about. That's a lot of work. You know, my son is still alive, but my, my part of me is in prison with him. Mm -hmm. I never know how they're gonna end up, you know. You, if they're sad, you have to give them a sad face. If they're laughing, you have to make them laugh. I was limp. I couldn't do anything. All I could do was think about my child not eating properly. Or He had never even been away from home. I had sent him to camp, but it just broke me down to my knees, I think, because I didn't raise him like that. So I, I stopped working. I just was very, very depressed and thinking what I should have done. And uh, finally I thought, because I was an activist in the 60s, I thought I had told them things, but evidently not enough. So that gave me the idea to make the Black History Museum and go into the schools and explain their lineage. We, they didn't come from weak people. They came from people that wanted a brighter future and suffered a lot to get to that point. So that's what I want to tell the young people. They don't have to join a gang or just be themselves. So. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and now share a slideshow that uh, Karen and I put together for, for this presentation. And uh, after the slideshow, Karen, well, during the slideshow, Karen will tell us uh, a little bit about what we're seeing, and then we'll open it up for questions. All right. And that video you saw, there's a link that we provided in a description of the event. We encourage you to, to see it in its entirety. It's about six more minutes long. It's a great, great one. Uh, thank you, Karen, for sharing that with us. You're welcome. So, Karen, I'll just um, open it up for you here. This is a picture of you working in your, at your, in your home, in your workshop, right? Where you do most of these, these art pieces. Yeah, my workshop, my workshop is any room in the house that I'm set up in. And for this uh, documentary, I sat in the living room uh, amongst my other work. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. So and it doesn't part. it doesn't require a lot of room because everything is so small, but it's very uh, consuming, mind consuming, and you just have to be on target, but like any artist, I guess. But I can work anywhere, so that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And so here, this in this photo, you're in the middle of of creating a piece like you were in the video. Yes. You are have all these tools, right? Little things. 
I don't know how tooly they are, toothpicks and uh, uh, <laughs> pipe cleaners. And I started uh, creating miniature dioramas with anything I had. So um, this is a picture of a, well, a man being made. And I'm working with polymer clays. I don't know how many of you have ever worked with that type of clay, but it's very workable. You can uh, fire it up at home in your oven but I make the head and the uh, torso. And then I stick uh, toothpicks through where the arms and the legs should go. And that's how I make their extremities. And I bake them. And when they come out, the um, clay is very hard. You know, it's, uh, you can't break it easily. So after they're done, then I measure them for their clothing and put that on them, put yarn on them for their hair. So it's a process that I made up myself. I taught myself how to do this out of desperation because I couldn't afford to buy uh, black miniature dolls and dolls told my story. So I had to trial and error, do it myself, so. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. So here in this one, it's one of your presentations at school. Can you give us a little bit of info? Yes. Uh, when I go into the schools, I go the day before and uh, the school gives me 15 students to work as docents. Uh, I'll go the day before, teach the 15 children, and then they per help me present to their peers when they come in. And um, they helped me run the museum for the rest of the day. Now this particular school, about six or 700 kids came through there. Uh, they're only allotted, you know, so much time, but they get around and look at everything and I'll make a quick presentation. I was showing them here, the Google box that I made because all of them know about Google, so. That's part of my artwork is sharing with these children. And these are some of my docents. I give everybody a certificate after the show and then we take a group picture. So these were my docents for the day and it's whatever ethnic group you came from, you know, uh, you were my docent for the day and they all learned and we learned about each other and that was the beauty of everything. This is really great, Karen. And I just wanna emphasize that at least to me, this, this engagement that you do speaks of the many layers of your work, right? Yeah. You're not only creating art, you're going in there and sharing it. You're involving mm -hmm. the students to, you're actually teaching them to yeah. teach others. Right. I mean, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of things that you're contributing to, right? Yes, yes, I am. I am, and I'm proud of it. Uh, I came in one day. There's some more of my docents, and that's the Google box, and some more of my boxes down there. I came in one day, and one little boy had about six kids around him on the floor, and he was telling them about one shadow box. And if I had taken a picture of that, it would have been wonderful because he was a docent and you know, he was like the teacher and it was beautiful to see that. So they are engaged. That's the thing for me. That's, so. that's very beautiful indeed, Karen. And I wanna just bring in something really quickly, kind of an observation. I think what you just gave us is an example of people, in this case, kids appropriating mm -hmm. these exhibits, which mm -hmm. I think if more museums did that, people would be invested in them, right? Mm -hmm. In your case, the investment these kids develop, even for that one school day, is very clear. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. yes, the teachers tell me on their way out, they'll never forget this for the rest of their life. They tell me that the ones, when we choose docents, we choose the scholars, but we also choose children that are, having a little rough time and trying to do better in school. And they said they all feel like rock stars because they got to spend the whole day um, 
being a representative for this museum to their peers. So it, it is a lot of components to this museum that I'm very proud of. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I should get to the hard luck story yet, but this takes a lot of organization, energy, and time. So right now I'm thinking of a more permanent place so the, the public can come to where I am. And, Thank you, uh, Karen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a perfect segue into this next photo. Well, we have more, more of these, but there's another picture I wanna share here real quick. And Karen, you can tell us about it more, but you told me that you give this prompt at the end of the exhibit, what mm -hmm. I saw today. And this is an example, everyone, of a kid's response, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. They will, I <clears throat> created it so they could write down what they saw today and take it home and show their parents. But they were all leaving it for me. Here, Miss Karen, here, Miss Karen. So I ended up with a lot of pictures of my work. These must have been kindergartners or first graders or something like that, maybe first graders. But I just kept them and I love them. I just love to see them and, you know. Some people, wrote, some people wrote me poems in the libraries, and it was just wonderful, wonderful. Here's another photo of, uh, of a prompt. Yeah, they're so cute with their spelling and everything. They're pretty good, huh? I liked everything. Yeah, it's very special to me that they would think to give that to me as if to tell me they appreciated the work. So I save all correspondence with children. Absolutely. Thank you. So we'll just share this one example. Mm -hmm. um, I was commissioned by the uh, Los Angeles Public Library um, to make three dioramas for their uh, 21 uh, collection exhibit. And one was Black Lives Matter. Another was homelessness. And one was on Kendrick Lamar, who is from Compton. He's a uh, rapper. He was the first one to ever get a um, Grammy that rapped. So mm -hmm. we're all very proud of him, but I kind of made a caricature of him. Uh, plus, others of my work in the shadow boxes they exhibited. We stayed there about five or six months. And from that, a lot of exposure. And that's how the uh, documentary came to pass and things have kind of been going since then. Thank you but so I much. had to present this and something that wouldn't be so <clears throat> gruesome to tell this story. And that was to show that all the children were uh, Trayvon Martin. And of course, a family saying goodbye to a uh, departed one and then the protests. So that's called a trilogy box. My husband makes the boxes. And then we tell stories like that. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. And there we go. Mm -hmm. And then we're back to, uh, to seeing each other more. But I'm going to stop it there. And I'm going to open it up for questions. But if I may, I'd like to uh, start with one question first, Karen. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned in your video that, and you just said it earlier, that this art saved you and created yes. joy in your life. Yes. But I wanted to ask you about your intentions of healing at the social level. So I see two examples. One is that maybe these kids you're engaging and teaching about history and society, they themselves are going through a difficult time at home or at school, right? That's one way at least. But also you're speaking through your work to all of us. And, in, and in, as such, I think you're contributing to healing the collective wounds caused by racial violence. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can tell us your thoughts on how 
through this, I guess, kind of stepping back from your work, how you have come to appreciate how the little things can have big impacts. Because to me, it's almost like a metaphor that speaks to the little actions we can do every day having a greater impact beyond ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was very personal to me because of the trouble my son got in that ruined his life. I didn't want to see another mother or child going through that. And so I felt by teaching, especially uh, African-American children, but all children, they need to learn their history because all of our ancestors contributed to us being here today. I don't care who you are, what you are. You had somebody that represented you and that's why you're doing what you're doing today. Uh, us as a group, uh, they intensely took it out of uh, education and a lot of people at home don't know so they don't teach the children. So I felt like this little part would be influential because I can't march anymore, but I can do this. And we'll open it up for, for questions. You can either put them in the chat and um, or unmute yourself too and, and ask Karen anything. Heidi will have a question in a few, in, in a little bit longer, but right now the audience, if you'd like to ask anything, this is a good time. My name is Karen. Can you talk a little bit about um, your, your ideas for having a more permanent exhibit? Um, my ideas are God. <laughs> That's for all the grace and mercy he can give me. But uh, uh, basically looking for really someone that uh, believes the way I believe and might donate a building for a dollar a year, you know, I could really get creative with praying. But uh, I have very limited uh, means. So um, I had one lady, she was offered to buy the museum in Chicago. And I would rather do that than not show it at all. So I would have to go there and they're building a museum. And right now, but, it's uh, your home, or, or yeah, it now? I'm just. Uh, it's in storage. The museum is in storage. I've had quite a bit of um, things. Um, people coming there to film different things. Uh, so I'll bring the the work home, so it'll be part of the whatever they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank so. you. There is a question by Josefa uh, asking, how is your son now? He's, he's hanging in there. Uh, when I talk to him, he's never down. I think he knows instinctively, you know, that I would worry to death and what have you. He married his childhood sweetheart uh, about five years ago. So she goes to see him and, you know, I'm just grateful to God that he got to experience love. So we can't talk about that. Anymore. Anymore. Thank you so much, Karen. There's another question by Frances. She, she asks, could you talk about working at scale? Do you create different miniatures at different scales or do you always work with the same size? Um, my scale is one half to 12 inches. Uh, I go smaller, but say like with lipstick uh, containers or um, finger polish, you know, and food items, you know, I make those, but I can't, I can't make a person that's the trained people. I'll buy the trained people and paint them. <laughs> so they look whatever ethnic group I'm creating. So it's, I use everything. I've used my children, my grandchildren's toys, you know, if it was the right scale or, you know, that's what I do. Probably doesn't make sense to a lot of people. But I was just interested, uh, Karen, do you draw at all? You, you don't have to do any preparatory drawings? These, these. Yes, I do. 
Oh, you yes, do? Yes, I do. I do sketches. I'm not, you know, an artist that way by any stretch of the imagination. But I draw each scene out first and, you know, kind of look at it and see if it'll work or because I have to be careful when uh, presenting to children. Uh, the first story I told about the clan, I had the clan coming in with torches and, you know, all that stuff. And it was too graphic. We would have to turn the box around when the younger ones came in. So I had to redo that. And sometimes when parents come with them, they can explain it better than I can. So, um, yeah, I try to sketch everything. And it might one change. Second, one second question. Do Have you ever taught the children to make a box themselves? Yes, yes, I had a group. I didn't even tell them. I presented to them and maybe about two weeks later, the school invited me back and they had all made little dioramas in uh, shoe boxes. And it was on their cultures, everybody's culture and their you know, wishes for their future. And that made me cry. You see, I can cry real early and real quickly, but that was really moving to me that they would want to do that. So Thank it brings you me a lot of me. joy, all of it. <laughs> Did that answer your question? It did, and I want to see these things so badly. <laughs> oh, oh, maybe, hopefully, hopefully, you know, because people all over the country call me, where can I come and see your work? And I can't invite them into the schools, you know, they don't want the public in there, so, yeah, exhibiting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, I just want to say how how moved I am, Karen, by your work and your story, and it's um, just just incredible to see how big your heart is and how many lives you're touching. Um, so I, yeah, I'm very grateful to you. And um, yeah, I was curious. Um, there's there's such a part of me that wants to <laughs> wants to help you share this more, and I was mm. wondering if. Um, if museums have, uh, if you've reached out to museums to have exhibits at other museums, and it just seems like such a fit. You know what is going on now? More places are um, commissioning me. Mm. Like, uh, right, I just finished a commission for the Archery Museum of the West, of the Old West in Los Angeles. Beautiful, big, big. Uh, museum there about the wild west and cowboys but they had nothing about the black cowboys that existed mm -hmm. so uh, they requested that I make four boxes for them telling about the exodusters which were uh, freed slaves that uh, traveled across the country in different ways and they had their own settlements so uh, I made that two of them there and then I made one on Bass Reeves, who was a federal marshal, the first black federal marshal in the United States, which the Lone Ranger was based on, Bass Reeves. Then I made one on uh, Bill Pickett, who was the bulldogger. He was, uh, he, they still have the uh, Bill Pickett Invitational. So these were people that lived in a time that, you know, it wasn't recognized as much in today. So they commissioned me to do that and we'll be opening that exhibit uh, April 22nd, they said. Mm -hmm. PBS came and shot a little documentary, so that'll be in there. So it's been a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so um, Karen, um, yes. This is, my name is Diana. Diana Hi, Joy. how are you? And, and I'm so excited and I'm like five hours, uh, well, probably seven, eight hours uh, uh, difference. And so I got all my times mixed up, but oh, I do wow. plan to get back, back in touch. And I hope that I see this is being recorded. So I'll get to see the whole thing again. But um, I, there are two reasons. First of all, 
Uh, we have something that we started called the African American Craft Initiative at the uh, at the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. And mm -hmm. I know we would love to get back in touch with you about the kinds of things that you're doing, and um, um, you know, have a, a, a at the very least a conversation and and presentation, and then and then see what else. But the other thing is that personally. I remember I used to collect my Mary. I don't know if you remember that from way, way long ago. There was this series, or if anyone who this was this was like over 50 years ago. So it was a series of miniatures. And you, you know, I, we used to have toy store, little toy stores on the corner where you could go and buy mm -hmm. a My Mary. And I used to save up my allowance to go and buy. My Mary stuff because I love miniatures. Oh, so wow. my love for miniatures and for the work you do goes way, way, way back. Isn't and, it something yeah. to love something small? It's something yeah. magical about that. And uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know about those miniatures. Mine came, the love came later, but uh, I know what you're speaking of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you collect Thank them? I did, but you know, you know, when you grow up and go to college, a lot of that. Yeah. Right, right, right. Oh. Well, it's never too late to fall in love again. That's true. Now, I That's was 40 true. something when I started and I'll be 71 this year. So, wow. and it's been a wow. joy every year. Oh, that's wonderful. That's mm -hmm. really wonderful. Well, so great. To, to to see you and to meet you. At well, least thank on you. On the small screen. Uh huh. Yes. On the small screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh. We have a lovely comment from Kim in the chat. Uh, Kim says, "I love your heart, Karen." Tell her I said <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Kim. <laughs> You also asked if there is anything that you're currently working on or any projects that you've had to put a hold on. In uh, addition some, to that, I've been gone from home for about a month just to rest with my family. Uh, my next project, I want to be Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, not the massacre, but I want to create downtown uh, the Black Wall Street and how Blacks dressed and act during that period. So, and then if we have a backup where it explains everything, fine. But I want to show how it was, and that's going to be kind of an undertaking because yeah, everything has okay, to be um, built. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Karen, um, regarding your mm -hmm. husband. Mm -hmm. Yes. How is he doing and is he still collaborating with you on the boxes? Oh yeah, yeah, he would carry, he would rent the trucks, carry the boxes, unload, and he developed hernias. So he couldn't really lift them, but he can still make a box. So he has his little workshop in the garage and he still makes the boxes, but he's fine, he's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, taught himself how to do it. We started decorating wooden cigar boxes, but then we couldn't find those anymore. And the work progressed. So he taught himself how to make the shackle boxes. And we've been, you know, we're one. <laughs> it's been fascinating listening to all Thank this. You. One other question I, I might still have is, is uh, I wonder if you could possibly estimate how many pieces you have now. I'm thinking in terms of a facility and how big it would have to be. Uh, we have maybe 55 shadow boxes now of different dioramas, different periods in Black history. Uh, I have some very rare dolls. People give me uh, antiques and things like that. Uh, the Black Book that was akin to the green book that would show blacks where to go, you know, things like that, that are priceless. And they admire what I'm trying to do. So they will, you know, so I count that as part of the, is it a two dolls? Oh, beautiful dolls and things like that. Mm -hmm. 
Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Are you a miniaturist? <laughs> no, no, but my wife is, and she she loved oh. it. <laughs> wow. Okay, I had a lady. Yeah, I don't know if this. She sent me three huge boxes of miniatures that her mother passed away and never got to use. And they are the plates, uh, everything, furniture from the early 1900s and things like that. When you said your wife, that, uh, that reminded me. I felt like a little kid at Christmas opening those boxes. <laughs> I feel really inspired by you, Karen. I, you know, I actually remember when I was in the first grade, we used to do miniature boxes of the books we were reading. Mm -hmm. We did some like every month, I want to say, and I'm just thinking that would be such a lovely project to do and to celebrate uh, my Indigenous Mexican culture with my yes. sister. Thank, mm -hmm. you. Thank you. And that's going to be another component of our expansion, because in Los Angeles, you know, there are more Hispanic children in the classrooms than there are any other ethnic group. But they always ask me, Miss Karen, where's ours? So I'm, I've decided to include that. Uh, and even of whites that helped us, uh, Underground Railroad and things like that. So everything needs to be told, not just the horrors. We even though they were hum uh, crimes against humanity, we still have to tell the whole story. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I tend to go on and on. Oh, Carrie, you, you're doing great. <laughs> and thank you everybody for these questions. I do, I do wanna be mindful of our time. We have five more mm -hmm. minutes as we planned. So Heidi, if you wanna maybe say, that. Yeah, I um I wanted to say to Miss Miss Collins that um when we had our phone call a couple of weeks ago um mm -hmm. you know I I just want to tell you again it was it was really very powerful in in many ways and uh, one of the things that um I reflected on a great deal was um just your heart and how your artwork has been part of your healing journey. Mm -hmm. And it just reminded me over again, it's just how art is such a valuable way of expression. Yes. And I think oftentimes uh, we, we continue seeing how our art programs are being defunded in the public mm -hmm. school sectors. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we were working with Artseed, our, you know, grantee from the last two years. And, mm -hmm. you know, Josefa has seen so much of this as well, the need, the hunger. The yes. children have yes. to express themselves in the media and want to see themselves yes seeing themselves being heard and being valued yes. for who they are yeah so um i just feel like you really your work has really embodied uh that need of expression and um i feel very honored to just have you here with us so thank you so much for taking your time to, <laughs> to thank join you. us I, i'm really honored thank you all of you thank you well, Doug, did you have a question? Did you raise your hand? Yeah, I, I just had one comment, um, Karen. I really just want to appreciate the emphasis that I continually hear you put on the story of strength of mm -hmm. your ancestors. And I, I just feel you em embody that in how you present yourself. And, um, and I can just imagine the children uh, receiving that through your teaching. So I mm -hmm. um, just wanna reflect that. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're coming to a close. I know we could go on and, and continue this really great conversation. I wanna thank everyone yeah. for coming. Um, Karen, especially for taking the time of course, you know, you know anytime, Olia, anytime. 